Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning into our Ladies Late Night. My name is Mimi Striplin. I'm the founder of The Tiny Tassel, a jewelry and clothing shop here in Charleston, South Carolina. And I'll be moderating tonight's chat for y'all. And tonight we have the honor of hearing from Carrie, Stephanie, and Jen, three of our amazing women, female entrepreneur founders. And we've got a few questions for them. We'll get to know them, hear about their businesses, and just get to ask them a few questions at the end as well. And we'll also enjoy some wine and biscuits, if you've got it, pimento cheese. And throughout the chat, if y'all have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box and we'll respond to y'all there. So we'll get started with Stephanie of Estelle Color Glass. If you want to just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and your business. Hi, Mimi, and hi, everyone. My name is uh, Stephanie, and, um, and I am the founder of um, a Color Glass Company. And the, uh, the company is named after my grandmother, Estelle. Um, we actually got started in 2019. And um, the reason why, you know, I did something as crazy as colored glass is because I was actually looking for some pieces for my own home that I was having built and, um, and couldn't find any. And I just thought of this idea that wouldn't it be great if you'd have all this different color options and style options in one spot um, for people like myself who might be, who might be lovers of color glass. So um, this really is a passion project for me. And um, you know, it's in so many different ways because I get to talk about my family heritage, I mean, in particular about my grandmother and just my own experiences. And I get to um, offer a product that brings happiness and joy to folks. And um, it's just a really exciting space to be in. Um, I've actually been in the entrepreneur space for 16 years and um, while it might seem like, gosh, you know, it was like overnight kind of success just starting in 2019, it doesn't feel that way for me because again, I've been in this space for 16 years and it was, it's definitely been trial and error, uh, trial and failure. And then you, because just the mere fact of me being persistent that I actually am where I am today. Thank you. We're so excited to have you tonight. And next, we'll have Jen introduce yourself and tell us about your company. Hi, uh, thanks so much. It's so great to see so many people here on the phone, including my mom. Happy Mother's Day, mom. Um, so I'm Jen Pelka. I'm the founder of Unfem Wines. Um, it is a company, some of you, I think, are probably drinking some of our wines tonight. I'm drinking the Cali. I know Carrie is as well. Um, oh, yeah, I see Allie's drinking some too. Um, so all of our wines are made by women and we work with women throughout the supply chain wherever we can. So we have uh, women winemakers in Champagne and in Napa and all of our wines also have a charitable partner that are related to women. So um, for our, the Cali, our charitable partner is Dress for Success. So for every bottle that you buy, um, some charitable contribution is made to the organization. And um, the brand is really all about celebrating women. So before I launched Unfem, I founded two champagne bars, one in New York and one in San Francisco. And what we found was that um, we had so many amazing women who had come into the restaurant. All of our investors in the restaurants were uh, women. So we had a huge community of women behind us. And many times women would walk into the restaurant and would say, you know, our whole list was hundreds of champagnes by the bottle and many women would take the wine list and say, I don't know where to start, but I would love to buy a bottle of wine made by a woman. And I thought it was so, so interesting, so cool. And so we decided to launch this brand specifically to showcase women winemakers who we love. And uh, we have now three wines on the market, all of which are available um, through our website, which is Unfem Wines. And uh, we have an amazing organic champagne we have this beautiful California sparkling that's a sparkling rosé that's mostly Pinot Noir. Um, and then we also have a still chilled red wine. And it is very, very fun to work every day in the wine space and in the champagne space in particular. Um, and it's especially fun because for us, it's also a family business. My co-founder is my brother. And uh, so the two of us get to work 
all day long on all things related to wine. So thank you so much for having us, Carrie. And it's, it's so nice to see so many happy faces here. Awesome. And last but not least, Carrie, if you'll introduce yourself and I see you're in your kitchen. I'm excited to bake up some biscuits with you tonight. If I worked in champagne, sparkling wine every day, I would be the happiest human on earth. So cheers to you and let's raise a glass that Monday's over and the hardest day of the week is done. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. cheers. Well, thank you all so much for, for joining us. I if, Did you preheat your oven? Do you have your biscuits in? I haven't quite done that yet. So I'm going to take mine out and just, you know, our biscuits are fully baked. So I'm just wrapping them in foil and popping them in the oven. I'm going to get Tara who's with me here to pop them in the oven. But I, I loved hearing what y'all had to say because I too founded a, a business 16 years ago based on doing something that I truly loved and believed in. And I think that's the, the secret ingredient. The secret sauce is, you know, I always tell people when they, they call me, you know, what, what, what is your advice? And I say, you need to have passion. You need to have a great product and you need to have great packaging. And those are like the three big things that, you know, I think get you well on your way to success with passion being the number one. But, you know, I started out with just an idea to share my mom's handmade biscuits. Um, and it was really an idea to just ship them online, but it has evolved into so much more of which I'm grateful to all of the people that um, have supported us because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to continue to expand like we have. So um, that's kind of how I got here. Awesome, thank you so much, Carrie. And I see we've got some people in the chat. They're loving the wine and their biscuits. A few have already baked their biscuits and enjoying it during the chat. So we'll go ahead and jump right into some of our questions. Um, Stephanie, I'll start with you. You touched on how you started your business and kind of where the idea came from. And we've got a group of really amazing women with us tonight. And we just want to hear a little more about some of the challenge that you may or may not have faced as a woman in business, because so many of us have probably gone through the same thing or going through it right now and could use some encouragement during that time. Sure. Um, well, there's definitely like uh, a lot of challenges um, that may be specific to, well, I feel were specific to me as a, um, as a female. Um, my first business is, is actually, is, is in a 16th year, is um, an event rental business. And that business isn't really, there aren't a lot of women owners in that line of business, um, particularly um, in my area. And, um, and so it was very challenging for, it was actually what it was for me was, it wasn't so challenging for me, but it was really hard to, it was hard to be seen as on par with the other business owners that did the same thing. So it was almost like I had to be a secretive business owner. <laughs> I mean, there, there was always questions about who is the owner and who, who is the, um, who's in charge here. So while I didn't have any um, issues, but other people definitely did. And so I had to really, it was almost like an ego suppressor. You had to really suppress your ego and say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm fine with you thinking I'm just, I work here too. So um, that, that's definitely a challenge. You really couldn't like, you know, um, you really had to silence your voice for me. And that, that was challenging because I felt like I, I probably had, but not, but I didn't have an equal amount to say, I had more to say. And, you know, and I had to, but it's, while I did have more to say and, and equal or more knowledge than um, the men in this space, I was definitely um, silenced. So that was a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I see now through Estelle Glass, um, I love seeing you in some of the photos and sharing some of your family stories and in the Instagram caption. Do you feel like now you kind of step forward and get to share your voice a little more and be the forefront? I, absolutely. And it's a whole different space. It's a different space. Um, and, and I should have said, like, I started out my career as a lawyer. So you were definitely as a female, you were silenced there. And then at, with a event rental business, that was a silencing moment. But this is a space of, of a lot of our 95% of our customers are women. So they want to hear from me. So it's nice to be in this space where you want to be heard from. Yeah. And Jen, what about you with wine and champagne that is a industry that's been around forever do you feel like you faced um, some 
issues or challenges that stick out to you today? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting because the champagne industry has actually had a long history of women being in positions of power. Veuve Clicquot is uh, named after the widow Clicquot, the woman who inherited the Veuve Clicquot house from her husband when he passed away. But historically within Champagne, the only women who have been able to be involved are women who have inherited the land um, from their husbands who have passed away. Now the land gets passed down from generation to generation to generation. A lot of women take over houses. But you know, it's so interesting in Champagne is it's 90% um, of the industry is consolidated with the top 10 brands. And so for us, we have a huge opportunity and responsibility to break through and to be a new voice in that space. Um, if you look at those brands, they're all owned by men and um, they are not necessarily talking to a modern, smart with it, savvy, female customer. And so what we think a lot about, what I think a lot about is like, how would I want to be talked to as a customer? How would I want to be engaged with as a customer, as a woman? And I see so much of the way in which wine is marketed to women in, and in a lot of ways, they're brands that are created by men and that are done in a way that's um, really kind of pandering and, and speaks to speaks down to women. And we feel totally the opposite. I believe that women can be, uh, that, that wine can be an incredible tool for, um, you know, a, a business setting, having really good wine knowledge is something that can be really empowering. And so that's a lot of what we think about is how do we sort of turn the model on its head and use wine as a vehicle for women to celebrate their successes, advance their careers, and, uh, you know, move to the next level. That's awesome. It made me think of like the cheesy wine commercials you see on television. So I love that y'all are a true voice speaking to women and to the clientele about a great product. And Carrie, to you, um, your product is such a universal, I mean, who doesn't love biscuits and pimento cheese, but I know that I'm sure you face some challenges as a woman in business as well. Sure, I mean, the food industry has notoriously always been mainly male driven and which is so ironic because, you know, aren't women supposed to be in the kitchen cooking for their men? So I just find that whole, um, the irony in that is, is not lost, but you know, the number one question that I get almost every time I have a conversation, except with a bunch of women is, well, so what does your husband do in the business? I'm like, um, well, he pours me a glass of wine when I get home and he listens to me complain about all my problems. And he's kind of like my therapist, just like he would if, if it was any other work, you know, situation. So I always find that to be interesting. I get that. And then I also get so you own this 100% is just you, you know, they're always questioning that, which, uh, you know, it's just so interesting, but I feel like we have all as, as a race, uh, as a group of women made huge strides to um, just in the last couple of years, really um, overcome this and, and, and really make, um, take a stance for ourselves. So I just think the more women, the better and um, you know, I just always have to chuckle on the inside when I get those questions, because not only does it make you super proud that you're doing it on your own, but it's always nice to surprise somebody when they doubt you. Um, you know, and I just think you have to be humble about it and just keep moving forward. And I don't need to, um, I just need to prove it to myself, nobody else. So that is also super important to me as well as I'm not trying to do it for anyone but me. And, and to be an example to my three daughters, our three daughters. So those, those are my, those are the things that go through my mind when I'm constantly questioned about that. Yeah, I think as women in business, we get questioned so much. Um, and I think it's either questioning your brand or your place or position in your company or the knowledge that you have, like Stephanie mentioned earlier. And it's been so inspiring to see just over the past year, women are kind of using their voice. They're rising up even more than ever and just owning it and humbly doing so, but owning it and making others know like, this is my company. This is where I stand. This is the knowledge that I have. And it's just so encouraging to see and to have younger generations see that as well as an example. Great. So our next question we hear this so much and it's a funny one because a lot of times we don't hear men being asked this question, 
but it's kind of the question that I know I, as a businesswoman, get all the time about balance and how do we find a balance? Does a balance even exist? So Stephanie, I'll have you start and speak to that. If you have a balance or any routines that help you throughout every day. Yes, um, well, I just have, um, basically I, I decided I was going to um, have a good quality of life um, for myself and for my family. And, and once you make that decision, every, you, you basically, you're on a trajectory to say, well, this fits in, this doesn't fit in. And, and I'm always making, um, doing a balancing act and, and just saying, saying no, or if something, I try it and it doesn't work and it's getting my balance off. Um, I, um, I just stay true to my, my main goal. And that was to have a good quality of life and to spend a lot of quality time with my family. And, and I've, I'm, that's what I'm committed to. And, um, and, and I've just been, been loyal to that one thing that I set out to do. And, and like, I've been very intentional about it. And, um, one other thing I would say is that um, you have to delegate. You have to find, surround yourself with, for, I'm learning this and, and definitely our team is growing um, significantly and I'm just delegating. And um, there, I, I know how to do everything. I've done absolutely everything, <laughs> but I only have two arms and two legs and one head, you know, so I can't do everything. So I'm learning to delegate and to um, just have working, being comfortable with having working knowledge of all the different moving parts. Mm -hmm. And Jen, what about you? What do you say when someone asks you about balance? Yeah, balance for me is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, I am one of those entrepreneurs, I, I bet like all three of you, who yeah. tend to say yes to a ton of projects and who is in this business because I'm really enthusiastic about it, really excited about it. I'm also the first one to say yes when someone wants to collaborate. Um, I'm the first one to say yes if somebody wants to pick my brain and wants to build their own business and needs some advice. Um, you know, I have responsibilities to my husband, to my brother, who's both my brother and my business partner, to my parents. And, and also to our customers, to our clients, to our investors, et cetera. And the only thing that I've been able to find that has helped me to provide any balance to myself is two things. One is creating a calendar that I'm really loyal to that really sets boundaries. So what I do in the morning, which is work out, meditate, have a good healthy breakfast, and then tackle my email for an hour. And then I start meetings and I have sort of a block of times that dedicated to meetings and then I have a block of time in the afternoon that's dedicated to project work and then when it comes to be about six o'clock I shut my computer I move my phone sort of away from me and I really focus on being at home with my husband relaxing chilling out etc so that's the one it's like setting some boundaries on my calendar and people knowing where and when they can put meetings and the second is if I am feeling burnt out, I give myself the opportunity to either take just a day off, like a mental health day to go for a long hike and do some journaling and relax and cook myself a good dinner. Or if I'm really burnt out to like go on a trip by myself somewhere, like there's one beautiful place in Mexico I've gone to twice when I've been really at the end of my rope and uh, taken a week off um, and done like a digital detox and relax and be in the sun and again, like be out in nature. And um, I always find that when I take those breaks, even if it's one of those single day breaks, I come back the next day, I'm refreshed, I'm ready to work, I'm a better coworker, I'm a better boss, I'm a better employee. And um, I think it's just so, so helpful and so essential really to, to give that, that time back to myself. And Alex in our chat said, even doing things like tonight helps with burnout. And I totally agree because this is such a fun way to end a busy Monday. I'm sure coming in for us having a gloomy Monday in Charleston, we've had something to look forward to, to come on and get to be among women like ourselves who are like-minded, which is awesome. It's a way of rest and a way of self-care in itself. And Carrie, what about you? You've got multiple stores, multiple restaurants. Um, how do you find balance or can you even find balance in your life between family and work? I, I definitely find balance and I, it is intentional. And, and just like um, the girl said, it is very intentional. And it's actually, I, 
I'd refer to it as a mission. Like these are the, this is my mission. I want to put my family first, then work, then a lot of fun, whether that's traveling, eating, vacationing. And there are going to be times where it's not always perfectly balanced, but you do have to set your calendar. You have to turn your phone off. You know, I, right before we got on, I said to my girls, okay, dinner, supper's going to be late tonight because we usually sit down at six, but you know, then I'm all yours. So, you know, there's give and take there. I also love what Stephanie said about delegation, because that is such an important thing to do as a business owner. And, and, and for obvious reasons like balance, but also you have a responsibility to the people that you hire to push them to the next level. And if you don't delegate and put your faith in them that they, you are saying you can do this and I know you can. And if you make a mistake, it's okay, we'll fix it. But that is what a good leader does is delegates, not necessarily so you can go to the beach and eat bonbons in bed, but so that you can grow your team and then your business can grow, right? Because you cannot do it by yourself. It is impossible. And you need to surround yourself with people that are really good at what they do. And the only way they're going to get good is to delegate to them and put your faith in them. So, you know, I, I also think, you know, balance can be with your husband, it can be with your traveling, it can be with your children. But for me, it's also super important to show our daughters that you can do both. You can be a businesswoman, you can have a great career, and you can raise a family. And it's not necessarily that I need to be with them all the time. I need to show them this is what I do. And this is what I hope you'll do. I hope you'll find your passion and do that. So I think, you know, you don't, balance doesn't mean that you have to be with them all the time doing things for them. I mean, for me, I want to make, I want to create super independent children that are go-getters and hard workers. So that, that comes in the balance too. That's awesome. Um, all right. Our next question, we all have businesses who focus either to women as consumers or have women on our teams as employees. And how do we lift up other women? So Stephanie, how do you find that you lift up other women, whether it's through your company or through your team or customers? Well, I, I just try to be an open book um, for my team and try to um, really, I'd really consider it a team. Like I'm not, I don't, I hate the word boss, if anybody calls me boss, I'm, I just, I, that's just a word I don't like. I like, I want, I, I always refer to everybody as team members. I don't really like, I really don't like titles. I just like think of it like a, you know, you've got to, I'm a, I feel like I'm a, maybe a quarterback because I'm the rainmaker. And, but otherwise everybody, you know, you got all these, all these positions that are very important. And, but if, if one in the end, we're all just a team. So I just try to make everybody on the same, make sure everybody's on the same um, level, playing level, and um, and just try to make sure I'm genuinely expressing con genuine concern about what's going on in, in their lives and um, and letting them know it's okay. Like, you know, uh, as long as you're doing your job, I'm, I'm okay to you having balance and, and, um, and, um, as, and all these things that you have to take care of as well, making sure that your life is going smoothly. So that's just my approach. I'm, I'm very new at this in terms of a larger team of women because most of our, in my event rental business, most of our, um, we had a lot more men that was on our, on our team. So it's, it's really nice to have um, some more relationships with women, but um, you know, I'm just, I'm, hopefully I'm leading by example. I'm, I'm just trying to be um, very um, accessible and um, accommodating because there's so much complexity as a, as a woman, um, particularly like if you're a mother and um, a business owner, it's just, I mean, whatever you're doing, it's just so much, so many layers and so many complicated things. And I will tell you this, um, Carrie, I, when I, I met with Carrie in her office and one of the things she told me was how she conducts her business She's just a cheerleader for the business. And um, she's just out there promoting the business and she's delegated a lot to all of her team members. And, and I really have used that as a, a model for what I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of putting this puzzle together. But I, I mean, I'm really inspired by what Carrie said. She says, I'm just the face of the company. And I've actually said that to people, 
I've said that to my husband, all I want to do is be the face of the company, check in and make sure <laughs> that things are going smoothly. And of course, other things that nobody else can do, I have to do. But I mean, I, 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 Carrie, I must give you that credit because you were the one who told me that. And I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and, and I and think you have three kids, I have four. So I yeah, mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need that. You need that. And I think that what that does when you, so when things start to get too crazy for me and my life starts to unravel a little bit, then I say to myself, okay, I need to hire somebody else and put another layer in between me and the, and for, we have 73 people on our team. So I need to be able to go in and be a cheerleader and that doesn't mean that I can't say, oh, this isn't the right thing to do, but I need to be the sunshine sprinkler. Um, I'm working, I'm working a ton, but I also have somebody that is the heavy that comes in and says, all right, guys, that's great, but we gotta do it this way. Like this happened today. Like somebody, we did a huge event. We didn't make any money. It was a great marketing event, but at the end of the day, like I was like, oh, it's fabulous. We had the best time. It was so great for marketing. And then my director of operations comes and goes, yep, but we didn't have a budget and that's not good. And so we need to think about this next time. And, and so it's great because you can motivate people, but then you come in with somebody else who is really black and white, not emotional and says, you know, next time we should do it this way because then maybe we can get marketing and sales out of it. So, um, you know, it, it's taken a long time to get to that point, but it has definitely helped ease things for us anyway. And Ben, what about you? What's one way that you lift up women with you working with such a great mission to lift up these women-owned wine companies? Um, how do you do that? Well, what I was gonna say is I just so appreciate hearing from other founders. And one of the ways that I feel that I try to give back the most, you know, I don't have a huge team, it's just me and my brother. So we, we certainly work with female winemakers, we work with um, women sommeliers around the country, women wine buyers. But I think one of the, the biggest and most important ways that I give back and also that people give back to me is speaking on a regular basis with other founders. Being an entrepreneur, being a founder is really hard. It sometimes feels really lonely. It sometimes is exhausting. It's incredibly exhilarating, incredibly fun. But until you've done it, you don't really understand how emotional it is. And so I always try to serve as a resource for other people who have an idea as an entrepreneur of a business that they want to start. I'm totally, as Stephanie was saying, completely an open book. I share financial models. I share my business plans for how I've built my own business. And I'm more than happy to look at other people's ideas and to give them feedback on their approach. And I think the biggest things that we can do as founders and entrepreneurs is to encourage other people to get into it, especially women, um, and to just really validate people's ideas. Like all the time I talk to, especially younger women who say, I want to start this company, but I'm so scared. Will it work? Is it a good idea? I don't know. And I will tell you, I was on a call today. I had two calls with fellow founders today. One was a young woman who wanted to start a bakery and she was so nervous and she had this huge laundry list of all the things that could go wrong. You know, she had a great idea, all the things that could go wrong. She was so nervous. And I said, girl, just do it. You're going to, of course, stuff is going to go wrong, but do it. And then I had another call with this guy who owns a tequila company that hasn't launched yet. And he had no idea what he was talking about and was selling it like it's nobody's business. And I don't even know if he's considered what could go wrong, but he, <laughs> I think that this is one of the, one of the reasons why they say women are typically more successful business owners. Once they get the funding they need, et cetera, is that a lot of times we think through all of those contingencies and make sure we've got a plan in place. Um, whereas sometimes, um, you know, I, I think that's the upside. That's the positive thing about women being a little bit more cautious in the risks that they take than men. That's obviously generalizing, but um, I, I will say when I speak to fellow entrepreneurs who are women, they tend to be more scared that something won't work out. Whereas most men I know who are trying something new just say, oh, I'll try it. If it doesn't work, I'll do something else. Yeah. And I think as women, we've got to encourage each other to take those same risks. Absolutely. And we've got a question from Anne. Carrie, you just touched on this a little bit about delegating. Anne asked, how do you empower versus micromanage? And how could you touch on this for a team of over 70 to a small team of maybe one or two? Um, you know, 
I, if you, it, I always tell the people that report directly to me, if I'm micromanaging you, then we have a much bigger problem. Like I, it takes me a lot to micromanage. So if I'm micromanaging you, then this may not be the role for you. And I'm probably going to bring in HR to say, we need to have a bigger conversation about what's, what balls you're dropping. And then I'm always saying, how, how can, what do you want to do? You know, I think it's important to find out what your employees strengths or weaknesses are and maybe maybe they have a lot of passion for the business but this just isn't the right role for them and what makes them happy what makes them tick what are their long-term goals you know I, I think you have to get to know the people that are spending 40 to 60 hours a week working for you and if you don't and you don't respect them enough to learn about their lives then you're not going to get a lot of a lot about out of them other than just basic job so I try to, I really try hard to get to know all of my employees, which is hard because we're in three different states, but I try to visit our, our shops once a month and, and I really try to make an effort to truly get to know everybody. I mean, I may not know everything about them, but at least remembering one or two things that make, make them tick and you know what they're passionate about. Um, Jenny Britt, Brittenbauer said to me about 10 years ago, you know, these people are providing a service for to you. You could not grow your business without them. It's your duty to also make sure you provide a service to them. This is my timer going off. Hold on. Um, so, you know, that I want to thank them for that service. I want to teach them. I want to push them to grow even more within the company, even if they're not going to be here forever. I do little things like I send out a Monday morning email. I try to recognize people um, for weekly wins. I talk about, um, you know, just little things like a, a, motiv a motivational topic. Um, I think it's super important to recognize people. We have, um, Tara actually came up with this. I said, we need to have recognition in every store. And so she has a pat on the back and it's this yellow board and all of our, in all of our buildings where people can just write a note about, I love it when you do this, you are so great at this. And it's great for me to say it, but your employees really are even more inspired when their coworkers tell them what great jobs they're doing. So remember that, encourage that, foster that and grow that part. And that's what gives you the good culture, right? And culture is a work in progress. It's kind of like a marriage. If you don't work on it, it's going to go down the tubes and it never ends. And they're going to be bad and there's going to be good and ups and downs. But the culture part, you've got to constantly work on. And that really starts with getting to know your employees and letting them know that, that you're interested in them and that you hear them and that you want to get to know them. That's awesome. And I think it's great advice for whether you have a small team or just you and your business partner or a large team where you can start that precedent and go with it as your team grows with you. And now that you've got your biscuits out of the oven, I'm that's smelling. a reminder for anyone else that needs to grab their biscuits out. Um, we will move on to getting our pimento cheese and adding that to our biscuits, Carrie. We'll have you show that and show us any tricks you've got with your pimento cheese. I know we've all been loving it since we got our deliveries. It's so delicious. You know what I like to do? I actually like to split them in half and then put pimento cheese on both sides and then put it back in the oven for like a toasty, crispy pimento cheese situation, oh. like your own kind of cheese toast. That is my favorite. But the first, the first one always has to have butter. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat a, a little bit with butter and then I'll do my pimento cheese. <laughs> Terry, they're so good. It's amazing. They're yeah. so, so good. What's the story behind the pimento cheese recipe? Is it a family recipe also? Yeah, it was my mom's, Callie's. Um, and, you know, there are not, there are not a lot of really good ones. I mean, because in the South, we always made our own, you know, I mean, you just grew up and it was always in your refrigerator. So uh, when we decided to launch this in 2011, there was really only one other great company that was making it. And I thought, well, this is crazy. This goes so well with pimento cheese. I mean, with biscuits, it is a no brainer. And um, so we started making it. Well, while y'all start to enjoy your biscuits and pimento cheese, I want to move into just the next section of our chat. 
And we're going to talk a little more about growth. And we've seen um, your three companies grow and turn into these beautiful things. And we just want to hear a little more about it. So Stephanie, you've had so much growth over the last year. And we see all the hard work that you've put into SL kind of come to the light and um, see so many people appreciating it, which is great. And what's next for y'all? Do y'all have anything planned or are you just kind of figuring out how to make everything work at this level? Well, uh, yeah, we really are at a stage of making everything work at this level because of, co of course with COVID, there have been delays um, with um, having enough product to service our customers and our um, drop ship arrangements. So I'm not in a rush to move to the next level before I master one level. <laughs> I, I, I've, uh, I'm definitely, I, I always like to do things in a way that makes, not like in my head makes sense, but it makes sense on paper um, and makes sense um, business-wise in order to uh, make additional investments and et cetera. So I like to always uh, make very sound decisions because when you don't, it really does put a lot of people at risk. And um, just based on, on these hypothetical, this, if this did happen, then I'll need this. So I like to have on the now, like the here and now kind of um, aspect, perspective. Um, but so that, that is really, I'm trying to stabilize at this level of growth, which happens so quickly. Um, and um, and, and I'm, I'm very comfortable here because I want to master this. And, um, and, and then we, like from one of the areas we could have a lot of potential to grow in is, is um, international sales. And um, we have a lot of interest um, from um, for drop shipments, uh, wholesalers, and um, internationally. And, and um, we're, we're we're gonna we're gonna say no, <laughs> no, not this year because we've got to make sure we are doing one thing really well first. You know, the U.S. first, and then we you know we we ship now. We ship internationally now, but um, there's just a lot more um, potential and a lot more interest. But we're just kind of holding off on some things until. We can master this level here, but um, and then there's so many, um, and just making sure we have really good um, customers, like in terms of the delays and things that we've experienced in the past, that we kind of fill those gaps in and um, and very stabilized and on, on those um, the customer service end of it because we want we have um, quite a bit of repeat customers and we wanna we want to um, make them a priority. Yeah. Um, we want to make our customers. We don't want to be greedy. And um, just go after uh, new people when you haven't treated your current people good. So I mean, and everybody is very important. There, there are no, there's no group that's more important than the other. Everybody, you have to. We appreciate every customer. Mm -hmm. So um, we're just trying to make sure that everybody's experience is um, is a top quality experience. And um, and, and definitely for me, it is at this level, balance it out and make sure that um, we've mastered it before we try to jump to the next level. Yeah, and I love that because I keep hearing this quote over and over all year long about how in business we can go deeper instead of wider. And I think a lot of times we have to kind of take a step back out of our business and out of our day to day and think, how can I kind of per not perfect, but get everything in the current state working well and well oiled before I move on to taking on the next big client or the next big step of the company. And Jen, I know you talked earlier about um, financing and things like that. Do you have any experience on that? We had a question about how do you know when it's time to look at investors? Yeah, great question. We're actually, we're doing a fundraise right now. Um, we're doing, um, I, talk, I talk to people, co-founders all the time about, um, their own approach to funding. And I think it's a very personal decision and really is one that's built on the foundation of how do I want to grow and where do I want to invest? And we're at a point right now where we know we want to bring on some people with expertise and we also have a lot of demand for the wines. So we need to invest in making the wines. So we've done two fundraises. Uh, one was a very early seed stage, very small raise, and we're doing an additional fundraise now. If anyone here is interested, I would love to talk. Um, and we are really mostly working with um, women who are angel investors. And the way that I'm connecting with most of them is through a broad outreach process of networking 
with other founders, with other people who have raised money, um, and people who have also formerly invested in the Riddler, the champagne bars. So we are bringing on a really incredible group of investors. And I would say for us, the things that are the most important is that we find people who really believe in our mission, who want to support women, want to see women succeed, want to see women celebrating their successes um, and want to see champagne used as almost like a storytelling and community building vehicle for celebrating women. And um, at the moment, we are really, really excited about the women who we have on board. And I really see them as like a broad community of people who can be um, cheerleaders for us out into the, in the market. People who have big communities of their own, who will celebrate with champagne at their own events and who can really advocate for us. I've always um, loved having a big tent. And I think that uh, the more people you have who have skin in the game, who believe in what you're doing, who support what you do, uh, it makes you more likely to be successful. So um, I, I, I really enjoy the fundraising process because I get to meet with so many women who are really interesting. One thing I'm very, very proud of that we've done in this round is we brought on a woman, a young woman who has put together what's called an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. So we have a minimum investment that's higher than what most people can put in, but this SPV specifically targets women, uh, first-time investors, and BIPOC investors, and there's no minimum investment in that particular vehicle. So people can join for $1,000 um, as opposed to something like fifty dollars or $100,000. So it's a really, really cool, really exciting way for people who have never invested before to become an angel investor for the first time. And that's something for us that's extremely important as we think about our cap table um, that we want it to be just as diverse and rich and interesting as our community. And Carrie, you've got so many exciting things coming up. You have your new show on PBS airing on Thursday called How She Rolls. And just talk a little bit about that and where you see your company um, in the next year or next few years. Well, I, I did want to mention, Stephanie, where were you about five years ago? I needed your sound advice on uh, get things down pat before you start doing new things. I am, <laughs> I am like the shiny, I love shiny new things. Because I'm like, oh, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And I never really weigh out um, really anything. I'm such, it's not good. It's not good at all. However, I've learned a lot. I've learned a, a lot about how to do certain things and how not to do certain things. So, um, you know, I think I, if it's authentic to me and it feels good and it follows the, you know, balance that I want and the mission and it makes sense, I'm like, yeah, let's try it. And, uh, you know, 16 years in, there are days where I'm on top of the world and then there are days where I'm like, I think we're going to go out of business. I'm going to quit. What are we going to do? And so, I hope that is very normal for, I mean, obviously we're not, but you know what I'm saying? Like there are a lot of ups and downs as an entrepreneur. And so um, I'm a hustler and I will do whatever it takes to um, realize my goal, which is to make um, Callie's Hot Little Biscuit a household name. I mean, that's my goal. So I will keep going until um, I feel like, A, I've done everything I can and here's where we are. And then maybe I do need to look at um, investors, which is something that I've, I've thought a lot about. Um, or B, this is, this is where we are and I'm happy with this and I'm going to remember to enjoy my life. Um, but yeah, we're super excited about the How She Rolls, which just kind of came about organically. And it was super important for me that if I was going to expose myself and my family to national television to do it with a trusted partner like PBS that wasn't going to expose us and turn things around and make it dramatic, which is not at all what we are. So my hope is that it will inspire other women to um, find their passion and know that they can do it and know that the life of an entrepreneur is no joke. Um, it is up and down every day. There is never ending problems and you must be a problem solver and enjoy that if you want to get on this crazy ride. Um, and then, you know, just to, just to do it, don't fear it. Don't over ask, don't over question yourself, just jump in because you can always quit, but why wouldn't you start? If you have a good idea and you're passionate about it, um, you should try it. Yeah. So. I love that. And I feel like that's the overarching theme tonight of just 
having an awesome idea and going for it and just seeing where it takes us. And we've got a couple questions that I want to circle back to you. A couple questions for you, Stephanie. Um, a lot of y'all are saying how much you love seeing the unboxing videos and your packaging, Stephanie, and how beautiful the wine glasses are. And um, a couple just wanna know, how do you choose your packaging? And Carrie, you mentioned that packaging was one of the top things, top most important things of building a brand. And I think that all three of you have such beautiful packaging. So Stephanie, if you wanna start touch on that. Sure, so our packaging started out like, a, a, I had a crazy idea on the packaging. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna do, like I, I, when I really started talking to my manufacturer, well, my glass makers in Poland, I had seven colors that I was gonna introduce. And so my idea was that I was going to have a box colored for each color. Like each color, I was gonna have a box to match it. So my lavender glasses was gonna have this pretty lavender box. My yellow glasses was gonna have this pretty yellow box with the gold and every all of them are gonna have the overlapping thing was that all of them was gonna have this, Estelle lettering in gold um, print, you know? So, um, and, and they sent me boxes. Like uh, I have a hot pink one and a um, uh, emerald green one that they started off sending me these boxes. And then I quickly, it was like a, it wasn't a light bulb, it was just like a, like I got the paperwork on how much it's gonna cost to do something crazy like this. <laughs> and it was like, this is such a stupid idea. So it was like, okay, let's go back to a, a white box will be universal. The gold print was something I was definitely not going to compromise on. And I got a box, you know, you don't over, I would tell people, don't overthink it. You don't, you think you, like I spent so much time, I probably spent a couple months thinking about my boxing. Just make a decision and go with it. And, you know, like a decision that you love, you, you're you very happy with the end product. But I was just, you know, I just talk to other people too, because I wasn't, I didn't talk to anybody about boxing. And so I had no idea about how much boxing costs and um, all the complexities that go into it. Like you get a die cut for a box and that's thousands of dollars. So like right now I'm very careful about what new products we're introducing because that means a new die. And yeah. um, you know, and, and thousands and thousands of dollars for a new box, you know, just to get it um, on the machine, not, you know, not in terms of the quantity. So you gotta really, it's, it's really good to, to group up with some folks that are in business and you can save yourself a lot of time. Um, but that's how I got to my boxing. And then the second part of that was, um, what was the other part of it? The, um, the unboxings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the unboxings, you know, in terms of being a creative about how content creation is a big one. I mean, with all the social media, you got to have new content. So it was just one of those things that what we do, we, we put a note card in our packaging that asks people to send us, uh, just tag us when they, um, when they get their gifts, tag us when they're opening it. And we just make that simple request. And, but the thing of it is, is when we get those, when they send it to us, we just share it. So we started sharing it in our stories. We share, we might have upwards of 30 to share a day of, of unboxings. And as long as there's nothing in there that's offensive or anything, we're just sharing them. We're just sharing them. And so it's a culture we've built. And this is all fresh content. And people love seeing them. And, and then the more they see them, when they order something, they, they share it. And so that's all. Um, that's all content that we didn't have to create, but it's new. And it's, you know, the customers are, our customers are happy to share with us and we're happy to share with our bigger audience and tag them. And, and so we just kind of keep it rolling. It's like a win-win a situation. And, um, and so that's how we just ask, we just simply ask customers and we just put it, put it in our stores. And, and a lot of times we occasionally put it on our feed. If it's a really, really good one, the lighting is perfect, we'll put it on our feed and we're happy to do that. And we're doing it every day. We're doing it, um, um, I mean, we share multiple times a day on our stories. Our stories are long because we're just sharing, sharing, sharing. And even like with, when people are making dinner and they're having glasses, just not unboxings, but just using the glasses. If they take the time to share with us, we're, we're just really ro rolling it over into our stories and, and resharing. So it's, it's just fun. Yeah, it's so much fun. Um, I think it's, our customers are always our best marketers and our best influencers that are going to share the product in use and inspire other people to shop. Yeah, yeah. And, and I like to, I like to share like real people using like the first, of course, like when you start marketing, what I had to do is I had to send my products to, uh, to influencers 
or people who had blogs that I thought would be a good fit. And um, it's nice to have them share, of course, but it's nice to have real people who, who just bought the product because they loved it and not someone I necessarily gifted a, a piece to. So I just like to share, um, it's just a real nice personal touch that um, I've, we've been able to add to our brand. Yeah. And I highly recommend it. <laughs> so we've got a little under 10 minutes left. We're gonna try our best to end right at 6.30 for y'all. But if anyone wants to unmute and ask any questions, um, feel free to do so, or you can put them in the chat box here. And if we've missed any of your questions before, if you could copy and paste it there, then we'll try to get that answered now. I have a question for you guys or gals, I guess. Um, I work for a nonprofit, um, but am the leader of that nonprofit. And Carrie, you're familiar with us. Be a mentor. Thank you so much for being involved with us. But um, my question is, how do you face, I feel, I, I just got, this happened to me the other day where um, a man said it would be better if he just as a man did the asking rather than me as a girl. And I wanted to respond in a way that was both respectful, but also like I've carried this on my back for four years got us through a pandemic, have been doing all these things. How do you respond to any kind of um, criticism or approach like that while maintaining your dignity? You want me to go? Anybody. <laughs> well, first of all, I would have to sleep on that because that my emotional <laughs> side would come out and I'd really want to say something that isn't particularly kind. <laughs> But I think that you have to assert yourself and you, you know, I, I'm always overly kind in a situation like that. I'm like, thank you so much for helping me. And I think it would be a great idea if we did the call together. And, and I wouldn't I like give me um, any room for that is what you said and that's how it's going to go. And there's no, oh, would you mind if I am on the call? No. We would love to have you be a part of it and we can do the call together. That's done. Mm -hmm. I like that. Tell, not ask. Yeah. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah. Any other questions? Hey, y'all. I just want to say thank you. And this is so fun um, to be on here and learn and listen um, from the best. It's incredible, seriously, what y'all have done over the past 15, 16 years. Um, Stephanie and Carrie, I mean, it goes without saying how much I just love you guys. Um, but hearing you talk about delegation, um, it is just me. <laughs> I am still <laughs> baking these cakes um, one cake at a time. Um, but I think my biggest thing is knowing, like, when do I know when the right time really is to, I know you got to spend money to make money. Um, I guess my biggest thing is when to make the plunge and the investment in the commercial kitchen and knowing that that is the place where I can expand the product and different sizes and different flavors and roll out the other incredible things that Mama Mitchell made, you know, her lemon ice box pie, her divinity candy during the holiday season. I mean, my dream is to have that storefront and have, you know, all of the Southern things that she made. Um, and I don't want to miss the boat. I, you know, I don't want people to be looking at my website saying it's just one cake. Um, so I think right now my biggest thing is with it being just me, um, having no one else making these cakes, um, just knowing that, yes, it's time, bite the bullet, get well, into the well, space. Actually, you know, it's interesting. I thought about Mama Kate, Mama uh, Cakes last night when I was watching um, Shark Tank with my children because there was an episode where um, these women were trying to sell their barbecue sauce and they were selling it internationally, on, like online, well, nationally online. And, um, and I thought about you, how you were at the farmer's markets building a local audience. And, um, and, I, and I actually commented to my children, I said, um, when we actually talked about it this morning in the car too, um, <laughs> how it's good, don't worry about like being big, yeah. worry about mastering being small. And, and, that, and that you're gonna build your most loyal following there, your most loyal customers um, there. 
So, and those people, those folks will help spread the word and, uh, and, and then everything will happen uh, uh, transpire in time. So I, I just really like that approach of building before you try to do a national product, really test it locally in your community, test it regionally, and then, ro then roll it out like that because um, you, I mean, it's just a smart thing to do. It, it, it's just because it, there's no overnight success here. Um, everything is going to be in this, it is, and it's really good to start in small because, or start um, a, or like a more limited plan initially because you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you don't want to do, it's almost like it's sometimes it's a lot of companies fail because they have too much money invested in them because they just have the money and they just waste a lot of money. So it's nice to have to be on a shoestring budget or just have limited resources in the beginning because you get to iron out your mistakes and 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 perfect your plan that way. And you want you do that on a much smaller, losing having a lot less to lose versus scaling initially and then losing a lot of uh, resources, uh, basically flushing resources down the toilet and having a warehouse full of things that <laughs> that you have no use for or are offending a lot of customers because you overpromise. It's better to to underpromise and overdeliver and vice versa. That's my take on it. That's so helpful. Yes, I mean, both of you, I know, I think that the farmer's market is where I started and it's been such a great place to test the market, ask questions, see what they like, what they don't like. So if I were to launch, let's say the mini, Mama Mitch's minis, the little mini ones that could maybe replace the slices, see how people react to that at the farmer's market, you know, see if that's a size that they're interested in because again, doing something too soon, too early, you've got to think about packaging for the minis, how that would be shipped, how to keep it moist. It's like a whole nother beast. Um, so yeah, very helpful. I think one other, one other thing, Allie, that I think you could do probably is if you've got an amazing um, list of email subscribers and Instagram followers, et cetera, is to do a pre-sale on one special product and say that it's gonna be limited edition, there are only gonna be 50 of them, whatever, and see how many you can sell through, which you'll be able to blow through it, get together a list of, of people who wanna be on a waiting list. And then if there's like a huge demand for it, then it might justify you renting out a commercial kitchen part of the week. And you'll already know that there's demand for your product plus, your people are going to feel like it's sold out. So it's going to make your product seem even more desirable than if you were to launch it just regularly, because people are going to say, Oh my God, it's already sold out. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah. right. So helpful. Yeah. I don't want to put the cart before the horse. I don't want, I want to make sure that there is a demand, um, for me to even for make a commercial kitchen make sense, um, as far as profit. So thank you all. <laughs> All right, we've got one last question for Carrie, Jen, and Stephanie. Just very quickly, what is one piece of advice that you'd give to your past self? Carrie, you want to start? Oh, yeah. Um, without a doubt, timing is everything. And the things that maybe you had to pass on or you um, didn't get a goal met, um, it's not no, it's, it's just not right now and trust the process and always keep great relationships with everyone in business because you never know when it's going to come back around. And so it's all about relationship building. And a lot of people are saying no to you because they want to see if you're really going to be around. So yeah. keep the relationships going. If some, if something doesn't work out, that was a huge goal of yours you just say, okay, I'm going to move that to my next year's goal or in three years. Um, because I am a huge believer that, you know, you manifest what you want and you say, this is how I see my life going. This is what I want to happen in the universe and it will happen. I, I can't tell you, it, it, nothing has ever um, that I've wanted not happen to this, to, to date in 16 years. So I feel really strongly about that. It's really up to you what you want. Stephanie, what about you? One piece of advice that you give to your past self? Yeah, I, I would say like to my past self, like when I was, um, I was practicing law every day, I was drawn to business. And um, I, I felt like this is just an interest of mine, but it was really, it turned out it was a passion of mine. And, 
And I eventually changed my career after 10 years in that field, but that was 10 years where I was there, but not fully there looking over the, um, the fence. And I would just say, like when once you, and then you gotta like, you got all these outside uh, factors going in, is what's good, what are people gonna think? And all these other outside interference or outside opinions. And you just do what you feel is the right thing for you to do. And cause I would have done it like years of maybe five years earlier, you know, like I would have just gotten into the entrepreneur space um, and um, done things that I was passionate about, but I mean, just, just really, when, when, when you, when you made a decision kind of look like close out all the other noises and, and um, just go with what you feel is the right thing, your own intuition about what's right for you, because nobody can tell you what's right for you. Yeah. 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 Love that. And finally, Jen. Yeah. I think for me, it's, uh, if I were to talk to my younger self, it would really be don't spin your wheels on things that you're not passionate about and that you're not good mm -hmm. at. Uh, find the things that put you in that flow state that make you feel like you're really happy that you're the only one in the company who can really provide the value in this particular area. Focus on those things and hire people around you to do the stuff that you hate to do, that you know needs to be done, that must be done, and that drives other people's passions. Uh, I think a lot of times we feel like we have to do it all. And the truth is, is that we don't and we probably shouldn't. And if we can hire people around us who are really passionate about doing the things that we're not great at, uh, it provides purpose for them, value for them, and takes all of that weight off our shoulders so that we can really focus on the things that we're really uniquely good at. It's hard to do, but I still don't, <laughs> I try to do it now and I still am not 100% good at it, but um, I try to remind myself of that on those days where at the end of the day, I'm just like, ugh, I'm so stressed out. Try to look back at those days and say, okay, what can I give to somebody else uh, in the room to, to do a really great job with? I love that. That's a great way to kind of just end the day, step back and think about that. Because I think when we put others first and others before us in that sense, then it just opens the door to so many great things to happen for us. And with that, um, I just want to say thank you all so much for tuning in. This was recorded and it will be put on the Callie's YouTube channel if you tuned in later or if you want to share it with a friend or maybe someone in business who would be really encouraged by listening to this. And just thank you all so, so much again for tuning in tonight. And I hope y'all have enjoyed our chat. Yeah. Thank y'all. Happy birthday. Go get them. <laughs> <laughs>